the theme next Saturday. <laughs> Five o'clock. Oh, no, you're not. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jen. And just to add another note on that, um, we we're really realizing our friendship group is fading away fast. This weekend, count four funerals. So, um, and then and they just keep popping up. You know, when funerals become our social life, we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's the truest thing you said. It's unfortunate that we spend a lot of time doing it. Um, today I'm going to talk about Athens and Rome, and then next week I have a surprise. I'm not going to tell you what it is, because... Be here. Yeah, if you're not here, then you won't miss it. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. I wish I could roll my eyes the way Jan does. Now I want to um, take you back to Athens and Foundies because maps have been here; they've just been stuck in the back, and I should have been using them. We're over here, just to orient you. This is. Italy, the boot of Italy, and then over here is uh, Athens, of course, we're going to talk about today. And then we have over here what is today Turkey. But remember, all of this was Greek. This side and this side in the ancient world was Greek. Um, and what I want to talk about is a very short period of time from 480. To 404 BC. So we're going to focus in time to this 76 year period, and we're going to focus on just two locations a small hill in Athens called the Areopagus, and then a larger hill, much, much larger, over here called the Acropolis. Now, even though the Acropolis is famous, and that's where all the tourists go, if you were there this morning, you would be among probably tens of thousands of people to come every day just to be on the Acropolis, to see the famous temple there called the Pantheon, I mean Parthenon, Pantheon in Rome, uh, Parthenon, and and they most of them miss this little hill right next to it. You'll see two or three people kind of looking around, but the the Areopagus is extremely important in our because it is the heart, it is the beginning of what we know as the American Republic. All starts there during this period of time. Let me tell you a story that might be of interest to you related to this. They would have, the citizens would meet on the Areopagus and they would choose the leader, they would choose whoever was going to run the country. It's a city-state, but it's a pretty large city-state, and we would think of it, it operated more like a country. They had their own militia, they had their own uh, ambassadors. I mean, they, they were, it was an important place. And the, the citizens would meet, and they would decide issues such as should we build a bridge over this river? Should we, should we uh, use money to supply this, this temple with something? Uh, anything that came into the purview of the citizens of Rome. But the most important question was who's going to be the leader? And they tended to pick one leader at, at a time. Uh, so for a year you'd be a leader, and then somebody else, and then you might be a leader again. It was. It was democracy in a very primitive form, 
because only a very, very few people could be citizens. But the, the concept was there. As far as we know, this is the first real republic in the world. And, and it, 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 this is 500 years before the time of Christ, so it's really important. <coughs> anyway, and, oh, and by the way, this is the very place where Paul, St. Paul, came on invitation <coughs> to explain what Christianity was to the citizens of Athens. Unbelievable. He was well received, they listened carefully, and over time, of course, Greece became one of the great centers of Christianity. Now, in why 480? Let me tell you what happened in 480. They were meeting up here, again, only men, only men with property, but they did represent, in a, in, a, in a sense, the people of Athens. And they were meeting and were interrupted by a runner who had, was running to bring them a message. He was a messenger. And he had just run, now Richard, he had run 26.2 miles. <laughs> from the city of <laughs> you just said it <laughs> no she did Connie just said it oh Marathon, Marathon. yes Marathon. from the city of Marathon the city of Marathon the city of Marathon is 26.2 miles away from Athens the center of Athens is really the Areopagus even though this is the taller the taller mountain so he comes in breathless and runs hard for 26.2 miles. And he says one word, which is N-I-K-E, Nike, and drops dead. Now, this is, of course, Nike means victory, which is why the shoes are called Nike bring you victory, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they were elated because they were being invaded by the Persian army and navy, and they stopped them at Marathon. This is a hugely important event, because it meant that for the next few generations, at least, they operated as a free republic. And it's during this time that so, ama so many amazing and incredible things happen. Now, um, <coughs> we know that the Romans, when they created the Roman Republic, were modeling the Republic of Athens. And we also know that when our founding fathers got together to create the republic that we live in today. They were modeling Rome, right? The tallest hill in Rome was Capitol Hill. Capitol line was the whole thing. And so the, when Washington set up the Capitol, Washington, D.C., District of Columbia, he, he, the largest hill became Capitol Hill. It's like the Romans. And uh, so you have Capitol with an A, the city, the place of government, and then you have Capitol with an O, which is the building itself, the center of the universe, right? <laughs> now, we'll talk about Rome in a little bit, but I want to talk to you about the Acropolis just for a minute. Uh, here on top of the Acropolis, you have this temple called the uh, uh, Parthenon. You know what Parthos means? Virgin. Virgin. Who is a virgin? 
Athena? Mm. Oh, yes. Okay. So the Athenians, that was their patron goddess, and she took care of them, and they took care of her and built her this beautiful temple with a beautiful statue inside. And this is extraordinarily important, because if you look at the Parthenon, it looks an awful lot like all of the original buildings in Washington, D.C., right? You go to the Treasury, for example. Oh, there it is, it's Parthenon, right? And uh, whereas the capital is the Pantheon. So in those two buildings, they copied endlessly in Washington, D.C. And it's, it, it's in our DNA, right? In our DNA is this idea that we're Roman. But the Romans thought of themselves as descended from Greek culture uh, by way of Troy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, the Parthenon is a place where people would go and bring gifts to Athena and ask her for intercession. Uh, think in terms of Virgin Mary. This very same kind of <coughs> hope that she could help them in their in their in their various problems. But what's really culturally speaking, much more important on the side of this hill, the Acropolis, on the side over here is probably the most important of all structures. <coughs> in Athens for our culture. This is the temple of Dionysus. Now Dionysus is thought of as the god of wine. Now he gave wine to humans as a gift, not for what we think of, you know, inebriation and all that. No. Medicine. That's medicine that would help people when they were sick. Because remember, back in those days, there was very little in the way of medicine they chose. But his contribution to civilization is not really wine. It's what happened in this amphitheater, the Temple of Dionysus, every spring about this time of year. The people came by the tens of thousands, and they were on the hillside here, and they, you, know, you can still see when the amphitheater was built, right? And they come by the tens of thousands in order to do what? to see plays, to see plays. And these plays were stories that told important, important information about their culture and religion. The ones that we have saved, very few, of the thousands that were probably written and performed there, only maybe a dozen are left, and most of those are tragedies. But these tragedies form the foundation of what we call drama. The word drama, Temple of Dionysus. The word stage, Temple of Dionysus. The word scene, Temple of Dionysus. The word actor, Dionysus, on and on. Basically, they invented the theater, the theatrical world. Every, every movie you go to, every uh, television drama of one kind or another you go to, even the sitcoms you watch, all derivative of this one place. And those plays were only performed, or of the golden age. This is, by the way, called the golden age of Athens. This is when they were performed. Unbelievable. That so much of our culture. Now, we're tying this all back to Christianity. One of the 
important ways in which Christianity was um, presented, if you will, to the world was in the Catholic Mass. If you think about what is the Catholic Mass in the end, it is a dramatic presentation of what happened in the Passion of Christ. The moment of his sacrifice. It's drama. And th th which doesn't belittle the Mass in any way at all. It's just that that's the form <coughs> that they use. Now, when the Romans wiped out about 500 AD, then drama goes into to decline. And it doesn't really pop up again until the church starts doing <coughs> drama for what are called morality plays. Morality plays, which is which is a very a, a very interesting point. But for us today, to know that the root of it all was Athens, and then what is one more thing I want to talk about Athens. Also here on this hillside, underneath Parthenon, was a temple called the. Can you see this? I'm going to have to write this out. I'm going to write it up here, but it was located down here, right? So that, that the, it's the place I want to talk about is the Asclepion. Asclepion. This is the god Asclepius. This is his temple <coughs> down here, looking very much like a smaller version of the Parthenon. And this temple is where people would go for healing. Because Asclepius was the god of medicine in the ancient world. And his, his father was Apollo. And Apollo's son was, people would go to his temple. But remember, you know, we think of temples in terms of a place where you go worship. They weren't so much worshiping as appeasing. They were bringing something to make the God happy, uh, to, to make the God harmonious with whatever they were doing. And so this place, that is where they practiced what we would think of a very early form of medical therapy. Now, I want to tell you what happened in the Asclepian, because the Asclepian <coughs> was a place where you would go, and I'll, I'll, I'll use a victim here. Richard's always good for this. <laughs> yeah. So Richard has a stomach ache, and it's, it goes on for days. And so Jan, Richard, we've got to take you down to the Asclepian. You know, today, think emergency room. And Richard said, I'll be all right. No, no, we're going to take you. So they get the stretcher. Some of the neighbors carry Richard down to the Asclepian. They take him in. And we don't know exactly you know, how all the process took place, but here's the important piece. The first thing they would do was give the patient a bath, number one. <coughs> a person's all cleaned up, they'd go to a cubicle. A little cubicle that was probably just big enough for one person to lay down. I have a little wall in it, and I'll explain why later. Maybe a little door to get in. And the patient would be taken to that, and there'd be a pallet in the cubicle. They'd say, now, here are your instructions. We want you to um, go to sleep after we give you a potion. Now this potion is very powerful. And you'll be asleep in a few minutes. But what we're interested in is your dreams. So try very hard to remember your dreams. Try to remember what's, what's going on. 
and in those dreams, because when you wake up, there'll be a scribe sitting here. And the scribe will write down everything you say about your dreams. <coughs> and so the patient is here to be healed. And uh, so the patient drinks the potion and goes to sleep. Once the person is sound asleep, an uh, uh, assistant comes in with a basket full of snakes <laughs> and pours the snakes on top of the body. And the snake snakes go writhing around. Now, these snakes aren't poisonous, but these snakes are um, have great virtue in this culture. And so the night goes by. Before the crack of dawn, somebody comes and starts picking up all the snakes, puts, takes the snakes away, and <clears throat> then, uh, then finally the person wakes up. And the scribe says, would you explain your dream? <clears throat> and the person says, it's a very strange dream. It was just like I was in. But then goes on to explain what happened and so on. And then the scribe, takes this and gives this to the physician. And the physician comes in and uh, looks over what the dream said and said, Mr. Monroe, I think here's what you should do. In other words, it's going to give you a prescription. Why don't you go home? I want you to eat anything at all for three days. Now you can drink some water. That's it. Then after three days, I believe you'll be fine. Thank you, sir. And there'll be a contribution, of course. We, that, nothing's changed in that. <laughs> there'll be a contribution. Now, I want you to think about this. What is the historic symbol of medicine? It is called, it is with the rod of Asclepius. And it has a snake going up it. Every god, by the way, had a, had a rod. And like Poseidon, you know, his rod had three teeth on it, so it's called trident, which means literally three teeth. Well, the rod of Asclepius then became, over the years, the symbol of medicine. And so to this day, you'll see it. But you also see a similar rod that has been used as the symbol of medicine. Only this one has two snakes, like this. And then there'll be some feathers up here. This is a rod of Hermes, which in Latin would be the rod of, of Mercury. Now, this is also used for medicine. This is very strange. What happened is, there was a, a man working for the Army Medical Corps. <coughs> and he was, one, he, somehow his brain got these two confused. And so he used, for the Army, he used this one. And most people not being aware of the much difference, nobody questioned it. And then it just it got accepted. So today, medical organizations have one snake or two. And uh, for example, it's Blue Cross, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. Anybody? One or two? I think it's two. You have your card. I hope. 
Richard. Uh, American Medical Association, Karen. Howard mm -hmm. By the way, that Asclepius, that Asclep, uh, the Asclepian, one of the men who came to study there was a man named, a Greek man by the name of Hippocrates. And he studied at the Asclepian. And he then became known as the father of medicine. It's what? He took it out. What happens if we take you to the emergency right? I have the Medicare, Medicare now. now. You have Medicare now? Yeah. And they know that over here across the street of the Bay And there's a show. It looks like one snake to me. Yeah, it's one snake. Blue Cross Blue Shield. By the way, who, you, know, you know who dreamed up Blue Cross Blue Shield? The teachers in Texas. Mm, that's a little general. It was one specific superintendent of schools in Dallas, Texas, Dallas, named Texas. Justin Kimball. And Justin Kimball said, we need some kind of medical fund. So he took 25 cents out of every paycheck every month and started with Cross Blue Shield. And I think it's still the largest medical, yeah, one medical certainly one of the largest, probably the largest uh, it's a non-profit, if I'm not mistaken. It has special kind of status, and I don't know what it is exactly, but Blue Cross Blue Shield is huge. It's huge, huge. All right, now, I want to transition to make the connection between the Greeks and the Romans so that we can, you can see how this all ties together. And then I'm going to try to I'm going to try to show you uh, as clearly as possible here on the map what we're talking about. So we're going all the way back another 400 years to the famous Trojan War. Now the Trojan War takes place right here where all these kind of lines converge in, a, in Troy. You, you might see Troas there, Alexandria. Uh, another place that Alexander took and named after himself. He did this 72 times. And, um, but anyway, Troy and the Trojan War is so important in understanding the Romans and how they thought they'd come to be who they were. At the end of the Trojan War, one Trojan and his men escaped. And that was a man by the name of Aeneas. Now Aeneas was the son of Aphrodite. Aphrodite in Latin is Venus. And you know Cupid. Now, Aeneas had a, a kind of a destiny, if you will. He was, should have died, like everyone else did in Troy. But his, his mother and the gods had decided that he was going to escape. Because he, his mission was going to be to rebirth Rome. And so <coughs> through the agency of his mother and most likely Apollo, he escapes with his men, and they go on a 10-year journey looking for a new place to start the new Troy. Now, he's traveling from here all over the place, 
And if you read the Aeneid, the story about his journey, he's going to all these different places, all, including in Africa, looking for a spot to settle. But he's told by a prophet along the way that he should look for, his, he will find where he is going if he can find the Sibyl of Kumei. Now Kumei, if you, we can find Naples on the map here, here we go. Yeah, it's here as Neapolis. Naples means new city. And just north of that, the south of Rome, is a place called Kumei. And there you have a Sibyl. And he was told, if you can find the Sibyl, she will give you the whole story of your future. Because remember, the Sibyls were these women. They're all over the ancient world. Uh, the, mo the most, two of the famous ones, was the Sibyl at Delphi in Greece, and the Sibyl called the one in uh, what is today Turkey called Sibyl. These are Sibyls. These are women who have prophetic power, and they can tell you what's going to happen to you. They can tell you what the solution to your problems are. That they, they can explain dilemmas. This is where Oedipus went to try to figure out what was the problem in his city where he was king. And uh, of course, he found out eventually. But but these Sibyls were women of enormous <laughs> importance and reputation, and people would go to them. And they would, they would often live in, in caves or out in some obscure place. The Sibyl of Kumei had a practice. She, she was in a cave, and people would come to her and ask her a question. And they'll say, your, your eminence, your whatever they would say, something very flattering to her. Um, they would say, am, am I going to have any more children? And she wouldn't answer. She would take, she would pick up a leaf that had blown in the cave and write it down on the leaf and just throw the leaf down. And then people would scramble to get the leaf. <clears throat> but she did this all day long. She was writing down things, all kinds of things. Eventually, people would go and collect these leaves and put them in books. We would think of today as a scrapbook, right? And these became the famous Sibylline books. The Sibylline books. The Romans did have scriptures. These are the holy scriptures. Believe it or not. They kept these on Capitol Hill. They kept them in the, the Temple of Jupiter. These were their precious documents. Now, I have to tell you what happened. When Pam and I, before COVID, were in Rome, and we're on one of these tours where you go to the Vatican, and the, the, the high point is the Sistine Chapel, the private chapel of the Pope decorated by Michelangelo and other famous painters. And there's only about a thousand other people in a room <laughs> that's smaller than our sanctuary. Mm -hmm. You've been yes. there. You know what I'm talking about. Yes. And, you, and you need to lay down to see what's up there, but you can't because you'd be trampled. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I, I was looking at things, you know, kind of marveling. And I saw this big lady, <coughs> huge lady, painted in a very prominent position. And so I went to my little guide. Who is that? Is that somebody from the Bible? And it said, the Sibyl of Kume is in. I painted her. And it turns out about four other Sibyls 
in the private chapel of the Pope. Now, talk about a connection between the a, 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 a connection that is so hard for us, uh, us to appreciate of how these women who are not Christian, obviously, are pagan, right? They are from the previous religion, would have such a place of honor. So I had to research this course, and what I found out was the symbol of Kume in one of her leaves had told of the coming of Jesus. That's the story. And therefore, she received this place of great honor in the Sistine Chapel. Now, what you, what you have to what you have to understand is that Aeneas went to the cave. He had spent already about nine years traveling. And rather than answering his question, when he asked, am I ever going to be able to found new Rome, uh, new, new Troy? He said, um, follow me. Instead of writing, that, you know, the usual procedure. So they, they go into this cavern, into this opening down into the earth, and they go down into Hades, known to us as hell. And there are all the dead. And there he met all the famous people of the Trojan War. Well, there was Agamemnon. There was his father. There was Hector. There was Achilles. He talked to them all. He saw them all. And they all, they all told him. But for some reason, the dead know the future. This always seems an odd kind of concept, but they know the future. And so he found out, well, yes, you will struggle. You will have great trouble, but you will establish Rome. So he comes out. He's, he, of course, knows where to go. And uh, then he establishes New Troy on the Tiber River. And just to tell you the rest of the story, Paul Harvey would only have two minutes to do this, <laughs> and I have two minutes. So what would happen, what happened is that his descendants were all battling one generation after the other to keep the land for New Troy. And along came these grandchildren, Romulus and Remus. Now, without getting into all of that, I will tell you this, that the boys, they tried to kill the boys, but nobody could do it, so they put them in a basket on the Tiber River in the middle of February. On the, are you ready? The Ives of February. By the way, Ives, I-D-E-S, very important word. You've all heard of the Ides of March. Well, this is the Ides of February. Ives means full moon. But the Romans were on a lunar calendar. So a full moon would be on the 13, 14, 15 of every month. So, but instead of dying by drowning, this, they get hung up in a tree. The she-wolf comes out and she just gets over them and is able to feed them and they survive. And fast forward, they, they, they're planning to establish their city, but uh, they have a little <coughs> argument about what to, how to do it, and they have a fight, but I don't think they intended for it to get serious, but it did, and then Remus was killed by Romulus. So Romulus then uh, decides to continue on his own, takes a plow, and he takes a cuts a furrow around to create what is going to be called Romulus, shortened into Rome or Roma, right? And it, if, when, we, when we think about this, we try, to, we try to remember that there was, for them, this was the day that they were saved was the greatest day of the whole Roman calendar. It's called the Luper 
call, the looper call, and the looper call on the 14th, February, and that was their biggest holiday. They always had their 4th of July, Christmas, all wrapped into one on the looper call. Huge event. Well, and Christianity came along, didn't have a pagan holiday, but the people loved this holiday. This was their favorite holiday. They would not live without it. So the missionaries were smart and said, oh, no, keep the holiday. We'll just honor the patron saint Valentine. <laughs> and of course, to this day, we still honor. And we now remember, Aeneas' mother was Aphrodite, mm -hmm. Af the, the Roman Aphrodite is Venus. Her day, this is her day as much as it is anybody's day. And so when the thing switched, when it became a Christian holy day, uh, Aphrodite slash Venus had to go. But somehow Cupid survived. <laughs> so when you get your Valentine card from your loved one, it'll say, won't you be my Valentine, which, if you think of it, makes no sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you be my lover? Because Cupid is shooting his arrow of love mm -hmm. into you, mm -hmm. just as, and he's doing it for his mother, as his mother's number one assistant. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a Christian connection to a very important holy day. And I would say, Valentine's Day, still strong. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's been eclipsed by an American holiday that's just a little over 100 years old. That's called Mother's Day. But other than that, I would say it's right up there with, well, nothing's up with Christmas. But it, among holidays, it's, you know, it's, it's a very important day of the year. Now, I have a surprise for you. I'm not going to tell anybody, even Richard. <laughs> I might whisper it to Pam, but uh, she's, she'll, she'll say, well, what did you say? Uh, so uh, you'll have to come and find out. I hope I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.